Welcome, Campfire Crew. Hope you enjoy these true, scary stories. Haunted House by Gibby the Mole. When I was eight or nine years old, around 1978, my family moved into this house. It was built in 1851, one of the oldest houses in the area, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. Weird things began almost immediately happening after we moved in. The first night I slept there, I slept on a mattress on the floor in a back room on the second floor. I didn't have much in my new bedroom yet, just a couple of boxes, the mattress, and a plastic yellow lamp that had no switch. You turned it on by plugging it in. Sometime in the middle of the night I woke up, and the lamp right next to my head was on. I clearly remembered unplugging it. Besides, it would have been impossible to sleep with it on. I reached out and traced down the cord, and it wasn't plugged in. I was holding the loose plug in my hand, and it went off. I laid awake for a while and began to wonder if I had just imagined that. I didn't want to sleep, but I eventually passed out. and It had been a busy day, and I was beat. Sometime later, I woke up again, and something just felt very wrong. I lay there with my blanket pulled up over most of my face, with a little crack where I could see the room. Everything was normal. After maybe a couple of minutes, the closet door swung open very slowly. I was more freaked out this time, and as I peered out of my little viewing port in the blanket, and my eyes got more adjusted to the darkness, I saw what were unmistakably reddish eyes looking at me from within the closet at the height of an adult. There was nothing in that closet that could have caused what I saw. There wasn't even a clothes rod in that closet. It was completely empty. I shot out of that bedroom and into my parents' room where I spent the rest of the night. The next day, I gradually began to accept that it was just a case of the new house heebie-jeebies, but I still dragged my mattress back into my parents' room and stayed there the next night. The following day, my sister told my parents she wasn't sleeping upstairs anymore. I never found out exactly why, but I knew she really didn't like that second floor. Laying on the mattress in my parents' room awake that second night, I could hear noises in the hallway, like faint footsteps and door hinges creaking, and unintelligible faint speech. Though there were four bedrooms upstairs, we all spent the next and all of the nights that followed downstairs. My sister converted the pantry into a small bedroom, and my parents and my bed were in what was supposed to be the dining room. After we moved downstairs, the weirdness continued. Pictures occasionally fell off the walls, usually while we were in another room. But on at least one occasion, while my sister and I were looking in the direction of it, a small picture jumped off the wall. I mean, it didn't drop straight down. It was flung in an arc off of the living room wall and landed a few feet from where it should have had it fallen straight down. Many times while we were downstairs, we heard footsteps upstairs, doors being opened and closed, and muffled voices. Unfortunately, The only bathroom was upstairs, at the back end of the hall. If I had to go to the bathroom at night, I'd do my best to wait until morning, but quite often I couldn't hold out. I always left the door open and watched the hall while I did my business, because I was too afraid to close it and possibly have some sort of surprise staring me in the face when I opened it. One night when I was in there, watching the hall like always, the attic doorknob began to turn slowly. The door opened maybe three inches before slamming shut again. I bolted down the steps, nearly falling down them in the process. And from that point on, if I had to piss at night, I used a coffee can I kept under my bed. One of my dad's habits was to go outside for a cigarette in the warmer weather months. His cig breaks got longer as time went by, and he began going to the barn at night for maybe a half an hour at a time. One night he came back in the house, and he was white as a sheet. He sat at the kitchen table and glared at us with a glassy-eyed look I can't describe. He looked agitated, 
But what's more, he looked legitimately dangerous. I'd never seen him look like that before or since. Mom asked him what was wrong, and he just continued to stare right through us without saying a word. After a while, he was gritting his teeth and looking at her rather through us like he was going to murder us. I mean, we were all freaked out and crying. And then, it was like a light bulb simply switched off. He was suddenly himself again, and asking us what was wrong. We told him, and he didn't believe us at first. But then he realized he didn't remember anything after going out for a cigarette. It was either that night or the next that my folks woke me up in the middle of the night, and we left. They didn't even want to wait for me to change out of my pajamas. They just woke me up, shoved me in the car, and that was that. My sister was grown up by that time, and she went to stay in town with friends until we could come back with a U-Haul in a couple of days. That house, as it turns out, does have a history. The guy who built it was getting married, and he built the house for his wife-to-be, and she left him shortly after the house was complete. Despondent, he went out to the barn and hung himself from the rafters. In another case, I heard that a man put a shotgun in his mouth in an upstairs bedroom in the place after he killed his wife. Another side note. After moving away for many years, I had a job interview in the area in 1998 and decided to stop by the place to show my wife. As it turns out, it was still being lived in, and the very nice couple who lived there invited us in. Of course, I didn't want to freak them out, so I never said anything to tip them off about the weirdness of the place. Pretty soon, the guy starts telling me about how his wife won't stay there alone, how she hears footsteps and voices upstairs, and doors open and close themselves all the time. Still, I never breathed a word about the strange goings-on when I lived there. Just before we left, he told us about returning from a trip into town for groceries. Their kitchen appliances were fried as if from an electrical spike, and the cabinet and refrigerator doors were all open with food from the fridge strewn around the kitchen floor. He half-heartedly blamed it on an electrical surge, but it was just a cover. An electrical surge wouldn't open the doors, including the cabinet doors, and then throw food on the floor. This past May, we drove up through the area again, and I wanted to get a photo of the place to have a record of it before it was torn down or something. It is a 160-year-old house, after all. I didn't know if it was still there, but I scoured the area most of the day to find it. I was about to give up when I thought I remembered a road that went through town that ran by the house. And they had changed so many roads it was tough to find, but I took a chance, and finally I spotted it. It's still isolated, only accessible by a stub of a road, and the other half of the road was wiped out by flooding years ago, which made it tough to find. I was surprised to find that the place is exactly the same as it was when I lived there in 1978. It was as if it was frozen in time. When I took the photos, there were no curtains in the windows, no furniture visible through the windows, but there were a few dishes and a dish drain around the kitchen sink. I wanted to go in, but I didn't have permission and didn't want possible tenants coming home to find me inside, so I just stayed outside to take the photos. While I was taking them, my wife and I both felt like we were being watched. I mean, it was a really eerie vibe. Whether something is still wrong with that place now, I don't know. But it's very, very possible. The Fire Tower, submitted by Dominic12. There's a little bit of backstory in this to give everybody an idea of why I did what I did. Back in 1999, my family moved from New York to Barnegat, New Jersey, which, if you are from New Jersey, you know it's right on the edge of the Pine Barrens, where everyone says the Jersey Devil lives. I was 16, new in the school district, and kind of shy, but I had problems at my last neighborhood and was looking forward to making some new friends and not getting bullied and picked on. I mean, what kid likes that, right? I was a good soccer player and was looking forward to doing that, but the summer was kind of quiet when we moved in July. Our house was kind of on the edge of town, but it had a huge backyard that my dad helped me turn into a soccer field. It was maybe half the size of a normal pitch, but my dad was a welder and a fabricator, 
and he made me regulation size goals. It was pretty cool. When practice started up towards the end of summer, I made some friends on the boys and girls teams, and they were really accepting, and I immediately had a crush on this girl named Bree. I should mention the reason I got picked on was because of my size. I'm only 5'5", five five, and that could be tough for a guy. I knew how to fight, but I hated to do that. Anyway, on with the story. The weekend before we went back to school, I asked my parents if I could invite some friends over for a camp out in the backyard, and they said yes. Everyone's parents even let the girls stay over, as long as we promised to stay in our tents and no funny business. We all agreed, and I will admit I was hoping to get a moment alone with Bree, too. <laughs> yeah, boy! There were six of us total. Leaf, Nick, and Pat, who we called Charger for how he played soccer, always taking guys out. The girls were Bree, of course, Kiki, and Terry. I think I was the only one who had any romantic feelings for one of the girls, and found out Bree did too. Funny ending to all this with her, and I'll save that for now. It was a Saturday afternoon, and the Charger and Leaf came over on their bikes, and their sleeping bags, and had chips and stuff, and Nick and the girls were dropped off by their parents. It was cool because it gave my parents a chance to meet more people too, and the parents all sat on our back deck drinking beer and wine coolers or whatever, while we set up tents and then kicked the ball around having a good time. We ate a bunch of food my parents grilled and we're going to have a campfire and just do kids stuff. And somehow I got goaded into a bet that I couldn't do 125 sit-ups in two minutes. Back then I used to do about 350 a day and man do I miss that body I had. So the bet was on and I missed it by two lousy sit-ups. So I asked Charger what I owed him and he just said, wait till tonight. We all laughed and Bree sat next to me and we all just talked and laughed around the fire until midnight when my mom told us to wrap it up pretty soon and she'd make pancakes for us in the morning. When she went back inside, Charger leaned towards us all and said, Fire Tower, that's the bet. I had no idea what he meant and he said that there was a fire tower in the Pine Barrens only a couple of miles away. As a city guy, I had no idea what he was talking about but all the other friends laughed. Okay, I said, so what? You get to climb up there in the dark on your own. Okay, okay, I'm thinking. No big deal. I mean, how bad could it be? Turns out it really wasn't. It had wide steps, and it was like 100 feet or more tall, and it was a metal grating. And I'll get to the rest of that in a second. How are we going to get all the way over there? asked Kiki. We'll bike it, he replied. We don't have bikes, Einstein. Yeah, but Dom's sisters have two, and you guys can ride those. What about me, asked Nick. My bike's a total piece of shit, and honestly, I was having problems riding it on the way over here. Take Dom's. Dom, your dad has a bike, doesn't he? asked Charger. My dad did. A fairly new light speed that I was told if I ever touched, he'd kill me. I mean, even back then, it was easily a $3,000 mountain bike. I had a killer avalanche, but it certainly wasn't as nice as his. Dude, are you kidding? If my dad found out, my head's on a fucking platter. Dom punched my arm playfully and said, Don't be a pussy, and remember, you lost the bet. Fine, I said, but Nick takes my GT. You ride his bike, I don't trust you. They all laughed, and Bree asked if I was really going to do it. Again, why not? A couple of stories up and back down. No sweat. I went to our second garage and we all started to sneak the bikes out. Thank God my dad and I had the same clipless pedals. His shoes were a little big on me, but they'd have to make do. So we quietly walked past the bikes past my house. I peeked in the window and my parents were asleep with the TV on. My sisters weren't even home. If I remember correctly, they were at my grandparents or something. We got on the road and the guys said it was only like four miles away, so no big deal. It was all main roads, and our biggest enemy would be the police, or someone else wondering what a bunch of kids were out doing fucking around in the middle of the night. After like a half hour of our laughing and joking around, we got down to it, and there was no one out on the road. Only once or twice did we really have to scramble off as a car came by. And soon enough, we pulled up to the tower as it was right off a main road. And really, there it was. We stashed the bikes behind a berm and walked over to the base of it. 
There was a chain link fence around it with a gate, but we could easily get around it. Bree was holding my hand, and I was trying to be all Joe Cool. Charger just pointed at the stairs and said, Yell when you get to the top, and don't lie. So off I went. If you've never been on a metal fire tower, they really aren't that bad. But it was dark, and like I said before, the stuff beneath you was all grating, and you can still sort of see down. If anyone really wants to know, the tower I'm talking about is the Cedar Bridge Fire Tower. You can look it up. I'm not going to lie. I was getting kind of freaked out at this point, because it is pitch black going through the trees as I go up, and while over 100 feet into the sky isn't skydiving, it's still a ways up. Plus, I'm walking up with clipless pedals, and if anybody is a cyclist out there, you know how much of a pain in the ass it is to walk in those. After a little bit, I got past the tops of the trees, and I remember it being really, really pretty. I yelled down and waited for a return, but there was none. So I yelled down again, and then I heard some kind of vehicle pulling up. So I started to hoof it back down, making a ton of noise with my clips, but around to the second last flight, something came whizzing by my head. And then another thing, and then another one smacked me in the leg. Fucking rocks. Someone was throwing rocks at me. At first I thought, okay, maybe these guys aren't my friends after all, and this was a setup to mess with me. So I yelled out, what the hell, you guys? And then I heard people laughing, and I could tell it was not my friends. And where the hell were my friends anyway? So a bunch more rocks came flying my way, and then my heart really sank. I heard and could feel footsteps on the stairs. Someone was coming up. A voice called out, Come on, you little shit, come on down. There was banging on the metal, and while I didn't think anyone would do anything too stupid, I was still freaking out inside. I heard more laughing, and the steps kept coming up. I looked around me and looked for an escape. I mean, there was no way in hell I was going back up. So I did the only thing I could think to do and crawled over onto one of the crossbars and slid all the way out from the stairs, hoping it would be too dark for anyone coming up to see me. Again, this was really difficult with cycling shoes on. So I grab on, hold on tight, and try to hold my breath. I hear the steps keep going right on past. And then, even worse... More footsteps, and someone yelled out, Hey, Flip, what's up? Yeah, I kid you not, Flip was the guy's name. No shit. I will never forget that. The other footsteps broke out into a run, and they also went by me, and I realized they're making so much noise that I can probably get back to the stairs and haul ass down and into the forest, even though my shoes are going to make a ton of noise. So I made my move, slid back, got over onto the stairs, and then booked it down and started running for the trees. Then I slammed into something in the dark, and it was Charger. He grabbed me and told me to run to the bikes, and we passed a pickup truck, and in the light of the cab with its doors open, I saw Leaf and Nick by the tires on one side of it, kneeling down, doing something. I didn't stop to ask what the fuck they were doing. I just ran and got my stashed bike, and then we all heard these guys running down the tower stairs as we took off down the road, pedaling our asses off as fast as we could go. Leaf and Nick were trailing behind as we heard these guys yelling at us and then starting up the truck. I'm thinking, oh fuck, we're toast. But the truck didn't seem to be coming. Over my shoulder, I could see Leaf and Nick coming towards us, and then the shape of some guys pop out onto the road but there's no way they were going to run and catch us. But that didn't mean they weren't going to do something else. Suddenly, I felt something whiz by me and then heard a report. These guys just shot at us. Now I'm really panicking, and I don't know if anybody else noticed that, but I didn't care. Leaf and Nick got up to us, and while we were still paddling like hell, I asked what the hell they were doing by the truck. They were letting out the air on the tires on one side of the truck as soon as all the guys went up looking for me. They were hoping that I'd get down okay, and at least if they didn't harass us too much, we'd be able to take off before they noticed the tires were flat. That's exactly what happened. After that, we never looked back and just pedaled like hell. So the closer we got to my house, 
the more we slowed down and started talking about everything. But I didn't mention the bullet, because I'm sure that's what it was. I just wanted to get back home before I told them what I had done on the tower. We got close to my house and quietly got the bikes back in the garage without making any noise and waking my parents up. For the first time in my life, I broke a rule in my house. I grabbed a 12-pack of Yingling beer. I figured I'd take a chance maybe my dad would miss it. We went back to the girls' tent on the far end of the field, and we sat in the dark sipping the beer, and everyone was asking me a ton of questions. I had some for them, too. I let them know what I did, and they said that they had hidden when they saw the truck slowing down, but knew there wasn't much they could do for me. Then, finally, we started laughing about the whole thing, and I said I was never going back up there again. My parents never found out. I made out with Bree that night, and everything ended up okay. I live in Tampa now, am divorced, and believe it or not, here's the funny part of the story. I am now dating Bree again. She also lived in Tampa, and I never even knew it. We recently flew home to see her family, and I took my son to see the tower, but I sure as hell didn't tell him about my night of terror. While he was asleep one night, I told her about the bullet, and her face went white. But again, I would never tell my son like that and hope he never pulls a stunt like that himself. And then again, knowing that he came from me, he probably will. Can't Explain It Away by Milo Gal. All right, so a little backstory here. I've never believed in ghosts or spirits. I did believe in reincarnation to a point, but to me it was just science, since energy can neither be made nor destroyed, so it must go somewhere when a person is no longer using it. I have also always worked in the sciences, computer science, math, and chemistry. And I've done so since I got out of high school after extracting myself from the religious cult I was raised in. I became more of a person that doesn't discount religion over the years, but I have zero belief in any all-knowing being, rather that someone wrote out some rules on how to live in a society with other people and came up with the myths to create fear to make people follow those said rules. My sister lived in Nebraska near Tecumseh. Our house is the only one in our tiny town matching my description, so I will not give the actual city, leaving maybe six or seven close matches within 45 minutes of Tecumseh. She lived four states away from any other family, having moved for the military with her husband. She was in the military, not him. She found herself suddenly having a divorce when she got back from Afghanistan. He was sad and lonely, and apparently it only happened while she was gone, but hey, good riddance, buddy. So her house was in turmoil, and she didn't want to be alone. Being the wronged spouse, she took the house, the car, the pets, and got the mortgage with it. She called me, knowing that I was unemployed and fed up with living in my home state, and she asked me to come live with her, and keep noise moving around in the house and help her get back on her feet, with the promise of a job and a new career path that would do all the training needed on the job with state benefits and excellent pay. So I jumped at it. I didn't ask a lot of questions, figuring that what she meant by keep noise going in the house was to keep her from realizing that she was alone after leaving home at 18, living in barracks until she was married at 21, and then living with her husband unless deployed. Plus, I had the offer letter for that job and knew I could only go up from where I was at the time. Once I moved here, a lot of weird things began happening in her house. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, she has two dogs and two cats, plus my dog and cat, so things getting knocked over and random noises are to be expected with six animals. Also, she would joke when stuff was missing and say to check their credenza in the dining room and the servant's pantry, as the mice sometimes hide things there. No, she doesn't have servants. She does own a house that was built in the 1800s and is beyond huge and original and has restored pieces from those eras as furniture. She was almost always right, but again, I didn't think anything of it. Since I mentioned my sister and the pets, let me go ahead and tell you where we all were at the time this first instance took place. My sister was on the second floor sleeping soundly. She has PTSD, so she's medicated strongly at night and never makes noise in her sleep, other than snoring. She was with both of her dogs who were also sound asleep, and the door leading to the upper stairway was shut. 
My cat was laying on the couch next to me, sound asleep and silent, and my dog was sleeping next to the AC grate by the pool table to my right, in the basement rec room. My sister's cats were outside sleeping in their cave on the deck. It was a very calm night. No rain and not much wind to speak of, with our little town all tucked in for the night as they get up for work on their farms around 4 a.m. No, I'm being serious. I live in a town that outside of cell phones and new cars, you would think you were living the farm life from plantation days. So I'm sitting in an overstuffed recliner in the basement, reading a book and drinking hot cocoa. The TV and radio are off, and my phone was on the main floor, plugged in and charging. I was thinking that I should maybe change and work out a little bit as I had been down there being lazy for maybe two hours at this point. Then I heard footsteps above me. I paused for a second, wondering if maybe the dogs got loose from upstairs and were hoping that the kitchen door was unlocked. But I didn't hear the steps head towards the kitchen door when they stopped. So I kind of shook it off as being an old house that was settling a bit and went back to reading, deciding against working out. Maybe a page later, five minutes approximately, I heard the steps again, but this time they were heavier, slower, and definitely footsteps. They were coming from the area of the kitchen door, which we used as our front door, and heading into the dining room. I was kind of frozen as I realized they were way too heavy to be the dogs, and they seemed to be going towards where my sister was sleeping, heavily medicated and most everyone in our little town knows that she takes meds at night, so they call me if they need something. I closed my book, intending on setting it to the side and grabbing the shotgun from the safe before going up there to see what was going on, when I heard a second step of footsteps and a woman calling for Winston, one of my sister's dogs. It wasn't shouting, but it had the force like it was supposed to be. It sounded more like someone shouting on TV, but the volume was turned way down. And this was followed by a second step of footsteps from the kitchen door area to the dining room. I, at this time, was positive someone came into our house. I mean, you can't break in since no one locks the door, and those that do have several neighbors with keys. So someone can check on the house and pets when you're out. I grabbed a loaded shotgun and headed up the stairs. I opened the door to the basement stairs cautiously, since I didn't know how many were inside, and I didn't want my dog Fred, who is Nikita, with far too much strength and instinct to be controlled if he feels that I'm threatened, to get into the kitchen and attack someone. My sister knew some people that came in regularly. I know of one couple already who had free access to the house as they helped with the dogs, and he actually knows the house's problems, so he could better watch for structure and electrical concerns than we could. When I opened the basement door, I felt a blast of cold air, and the hairs on my arms stood straight up in that chicken skin style which threw me off and caused me to feel abnormally anxious. I could hear muffled talking coming from the direction of the hall where my room and office were, and the door that leads to the second floor stairway was at the head of. I couldn't make out what was being said, but I could tell it was a man and a woman talking to one another. I also knew they didn't belong in here, because one thing my sister tells everyone that she lets come and go is that they are never to try to stay quiet, as it will set the dogs off and wake me up. If they're being quiet, then we know they don't belong. If they walk in like they own the place and make their presence known, then we'll barely notice them. I stepped into the kitchen and walked around the island to the front door and noticed that it was completely shut, which made no sense because it is loud when the latch catches, and I would have heard it even in the basement. I mean, think hammer swinging hard on steel kind of loud. So to keep from whoever's in here from getting out, I locked the inner lock and took the key out. We have a deadbolt and a double key lock on the door, and we never lock the double key lock except when we want no one inside, so no one has a key to it but us. At this point, it was still in the back of the kitchen near the closed doors leading to the servant's pantry and the regular pantry and laundry room, so I had two doorways and a wall between me and whoever this was. In the hall, I heard more muffled talking. I could see the only other exit to the house straight through the dining room, the first sitting room and mudroom to the actual front door, but I could see that it was also shut. I realized that they were no longer talking or making noise, but there were no creaking boards saying they had gone down the hall, 
and the dog's barking was muffled, meaning they hadn't gotten onto the stairs. I was hoping this electric feeling in the air had them as frozen as I was at that moment. So I forced myself forward, staying quiet and avoiding the loudest squeaky boards to get where I could see the hall where they had just been. Just as I reached the door to the kitchen, I heard that same strange volume and all voice say, Good boy, like she was talking to Winston. But I could hear him barking like crazy and slamming into the door that was closed on the stairs. He was trying to get down. Then I heard a deep, harsh, whispering man's voice, like it was right next to me, saying, Be careful. Watch her. It was hard to fully make it out, but it made me suddenly turn to make sure that no one was there, that maybe somehow I had missed. I stepped into the dining room, racking the shotgun, to hopefully intimidate whoever it was that was trying to get my very vulnerable sister, or at the least be prepared to shoot if they were armed too. I looked terrifyingly at the stair door and hall where there was absolutely no one. Not a single person or animal was there, just two dogs barking and slamming at the door to the stairs trying to get down. There was a very quiet snort from my sister trying to wake up to their barking and the air was suddenly calm and no longer electric. Honestly, it seemed a bit warmer too. I couldn't trust that I somehow didn't miss them going somewhere. So I carefully searched the entire lower level and basement where my dog and cat were awake but calm and alone before I opened the second floor to check on my sister. I calmed her dogs down and took them upstairs with me, still carrying the shotgun, and carefully searched the entire second floor and third floor. I couldn't find anyone and nothing was disturbed. I know I had not imagined that entirely nearly 20 minute thing that just happened. I knew better then than I knew anything at that moment that someone had entered our house, talked to Winston, and tried to get up the stairs to my sister, who was starting to finally wake up, but was struggling. I guess waking up and seeing me beside her bed holding a shotgun in my hands was a great alarm clock, because the second she saw me, she screamed and jumped out of bed, reaching for her pistol that she always keeps by her bed. After she focused and realized it was me, she asked me what the hell I was doing. So I told her what had happened and asked her if there were any other couples but the one I knew had access to the house. She told me she hadn't given anyone else permission, but there was another man and woman that came from time to time and to not let it freak me out. So I let it go and went back downstairs and returned to my book. Two nights later, we were upstairs in her room watching TV when I decided I needed more than just being told to not be scared of another man and woman that came but didn't have permission. Because I had heard her voice again the night before talking to Fred at the top of the basement steps. Fred ran terrified and would not go upstairs when I did for bed. And also, when I called up to her and asked for her name, she didn't reply, and I didn't see anyone at the top of the stairs. But it was dark, and I didn't try to go up expecting her to come down. So I finally asked my sister who these people were. She said she didn't know, but they always came and went since she owned the house, which was about four years. She said the woman liked the dogs, but she never saw her. She then said that she had seen the man on occasion late at night, and he didn't seem to like or trust the woman. She didn't ever come upstairs, and he was usually upstairs when she saw him. Yeah. I felt very disturbed by this and tried to talk to her about how that wasn't right, still thinking them to be residents of our town or something, and told her that we needed to let them know they couldn't just come and go without our permission, and he sure as hell shouldn't be upstairs while she was sleeping because that was just creepy. She told me that it didn't work like that and to not worry about it. Then she said, hey, it was their home first and they had the right to be there if they wanted to. My sister is a lawyer, and very logical and smart, so I just let it go, since she was okay with it, even though I was not. I asked the couple that knew the house, and were pretty much our best friends about this other couple. The man we'll call Grizz, and he's this grizzled old farmer with a heart of gold. He told me that when his grandparents first moved to our town and bought the house he and his wife now own, there was an older couple that lived in the house my sister and I were now living in. He said they were very strange and very protective of the home, and they intended to leave the house to their son as it had been in their family since it was built. 
but the son refused it, saying he was above living in such a stupid town in the middle of nowhere. Maybe six months later, the woman suddenly died, leaving the old man alone in the house. It was a huge scandal because everyone thought he had killed her somehow and got away with it. So he was immediately shunned, and no one wanted to be close with him after that. He remarried not four months later to a 20-something milkmaid, but died a year after that, and she was found guilty of murdering him by poison. She said she did it for the house because of what it was worth, but she had no legal claim to it, and the house went to the village. It sat empty for maybe 12 years, and then again someone bought it, but they only lived there for four months, and then moved out of town and never came back, but rather they paid other residents to maintain the house. About five years after they moved out, another family moved in, but they left in the middle of the night, not a month after moving in. Then another family, maybe six months later, moved in. They lasted almost four years, but that couple ended up getting a divorce, and he cheated on her. Their daughter committed suicide after saying the walls were talking to her, and they would never shut up. The wife packed up and left maybe a week after her ex-husband moved out. About ten years later, another couple moved in, fixed the place up, and lived there for seven months, and suddenly they split up. She divorced him because he was cheating on her and abruptly moved out, and he moved out maybe a month later saying the house hated him. He went on and on with the entire morbid history of who had lived in the house. I mean, he had names and knew approximately how long all the people's marriages lasted after they moved in. He told me that every divorce that happened to the couples who lived in that house, 11 now that my sister is finally fully divorced, the wife left the husband and it was because the husband had cheated on the wife. He then told me that the entire town refused to go into that house, but he and his wife always did, unless there were at least five other people there. And even then, they wouldn't spend time alone in the house, because everyone said it was haunted. I was starting to wonder if maybe the house had memories of energy, and I was just mishearing what the woman's voice said, trying to connect it to my life in that house. But I did not suddenly start to believe that the house was haunted. I did, however, start to make noises all the time and listen to my iPod quietly when it was late and I was alone because my nerves were getting fried by hearing these people I could never see. Then, in August, I was upstairs with my sister watching TV and talking to her about work when she said she was tired and ready to go to sleep for the night. I was turning off the lamps in her room when she sighed and said to me, Can you tell him to go away? I'm too tired tonight to deal with him. I looked at her confused and offered to take her two dogs downstairs so they wouldn't bother her. She replied, no, 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 the old man. He's standing in front of my bathroom door staring at me. It means she's going to be showing up soon because she always follows him and Winston will go nuts. Also, he likes to fuck with my blankets. Just tell him to go away and he'll leave and come back tomorrow when I'm in more of a better mood. I looked into her dressing room towards the bathroom and saw no one. Normally I would say she was seeing shit because of her ambient, but she was out of it until we could get her script in town the next day. She wasn't exhausted enough to be hallucinating, and she was so certain that he was there. I looked back at her and asked if she was positive someone was in front of her bathroom, and she said, no, he heard me, and he headed to the stairs, and hopefully he'll be gone for the night. By the way, if he shows up, tell her to go the hell away tonight. She isn't letting Winston sleep, and he's cranky all day long. Then my sister rolled over and went to sleep, and I actually debated staying in her room for the night. I was definitely creeped out by the fact that she said someone was going downstairs, and she was so calm about it. I ultimately decided enough time had passed, and he was probably out the door by now, and decided to go downstairs to my office to watch TV. I stepped into the room and stairway that opened to what we use as a library, and I saw staring back at me a man that was maybe in his late fifties, wearing a very old-style four-piece suit. I was frozen. Everything seemed to get really energized as I registered that I could see the wall through him. I mean, he was almost translucent, like looking through gauzy fabric. And I heard that same harsh whisper from the first night say, Until tomorrow. Then he turned like he was going down the stairs, and he vanished, like 
outright vanished into thin air. I was trying to remember how to think, walk, and was trying to logic this away, but I couldn't come up with anything. I decided my sister was going to have a long talk with me in the morning before work, and I headed downstairs. I got to the foot of the stairs and heard what sounded like someone moving around outside the door, and I just knew it was this woman I could only ever hear, because I felt anxious, and I always feel anxious right before or after I hear her talking to the dogs. So I just shouted, Go away! No one wants you here tonight. Just let us sleep. And it felt calm, and I didn't hear any movement out there for a good minute before I opened the door. I didn't see anyone in the lower two levels, and I didn't hear any settling noises or talking for the rest of that night. The next day I asked my sister about what she had said about the guy and the woman and how she has been around nearly every night, but I didn't hear her talking to the dogs after I yelled at her last night. My sister finally told me that she had always thought the house was already occupied when she moved in, and initially she thought the house didn't want her there, but her dogs needed the room to run, and she wasn't about to be forced out of her home that she loved. She had made peace with the man after he scratched and growled at her one night, and she chased him down and refused to leave him alone until they figured out how to share the house. Then she said she tried to make peace with the woman, and she refused to be friendly with her, and that was until she met Winston. Once she found out Winston could hear her say his name, and she could get a reaction, so she stopped messing with my sister, other than every once in a while moving things and just other harmless pranking. But the lady will go on stints where she will keep Winston up for days, and then disappear for a month or two. My sister also thinks the woman is who told her about my sister's ex cheating while she was deployed. My sister had found out when she found under her desk another woman's underwear just sitting there while her husband was at work. It was like they had been placed there just for her to see. Her ex didn't even try to deny it, and my sister says she owes it to the lady for getting her out of her marriage, and that she likes the old man now and feels safe around him, especially that her ex-husband is out of the picture. I'm not comfortable saying I believe in hauntings and ghosts, but I am running out of logical explanations. I don't know how to handle this, and if this place is haunted, if that's even real, shouldn't it just be orbs and mists and stuff that look worse than Sasquatch photos? But at the same time, I'm going to have to somehow get used to this, because it is now my new normal. This is the only scary story I've got, and it's true. Don't Use Black Magic by The Superior I'd like to share my personal story that changed my life forever. I apologize as it will be a long post. To begin with, I've been a very kind of shy, naive, and God-fearing guy from childhood. I've had very little friends and obviously never talked much with girls. Maybe because of that I was always single these years when my friends either had girlfriends or even wives. Coming from a family who had faith in God and good deeds, I always used to think that there was something good saved for me in the future. Along the line when I turned around 28, I met a beautiful girl in one of my family's functions. Boy, I fell in love on the spot with her. It was the same feeling, they say, about love at first sight. I gathered all of my courage and sent her a Facebook request, and she accepted. Fast forward a month, and our chats became calls, and calls upgraded to meetings. I proposed to her, and she accepted. And those were the best days of my life, as I thought, this is the girl I've waited so long for. Thank you so much, God. But then it happened. One fine day in the month of August, she called me and told me that she got a good job in a good IT company at Prune. At the beginning, I was not ready to send her anywhere away from me, but she was stubborn and told me that it was her dream job. Honestly, I didn't want to be a thorn in her side and be in the way of her career. And the only thing that relieved me was that she had relatives in Prune, such as her maternal uncle and her maternal aunt, who ran away from her family and married a guy from another religion. But after thinking for days, I decided to let her go. Strange things started happening. I started having bad dreams about things like garbage and bones and abandoned houses. Suddenly, she stopped calling me. The text became rare. And I tried to call her many times, but either she didn't pick up the phone, or she would talk to me really rude as if I was some stranger. This got me very sad, and I felt dead. 
I tried to call and text and meet with her many times, but she just never responded. Finally, I realized she might have got another one. My heart pounded after all these days that she just left. With that broken heart, I decided to move on and concentrate on my career. I got a good job, saved myself some money, and I started to live my life. I started going on long rides and flirting with random girls, buying gadgets, etc. Along the way, she did use to message me, but just normal messages like updates in life. One day, I got news that she got an opportunity to go work abroad, and I was skeptical of this as she hadn't even completed a year in her company. But I didn't think much about it as I had already moved on at that time. A year and a half passed, and I was doing great. She was still in my contacts, but one fine day she called me and told me that she wants to come back and marry me. I was like, what the hell is going on? So we met again and started all over. Once again, we fell in love, and this time we talked to our parents. Her parents are very good people, and they agreed to our marriage, and everything was smooth until the day I got to hear some terrible news from one of her aunt's family's friend. She was already married. This time I nearly collapsed. I have never in my life felt so cheated and sick. Her marriage thing was a surprise to her parents, too. She married a boy with her aunt's family, and that bastard took her abroad with him. No offense, but he was so ugly that there's no way she could have married that kind of a guy, as I know her likings. And also, she was not that kind of a girl who ran behind money or went against her parents' will. So I started smelling something fishy in this situation. Her parents also sensed that and took help from a local Hindu priest. He revealed that a boy in her aunt's family loved her one-sided and wanted her at any cost. The mother of that boy visited my girlfriend's home in the month of March and buried two dolls that were enchanted and they were tied together, male and female. She did this in the backyard of her home and from that day itself, my girlfriend got hypnotized and hence all that other stuff happened. He was the one who offered her a job in the first place and then married her and took her abroad. But karma watches all. He lost all of his money abroad. His father died and he nearly came to the road. He and my ex-girlfriend started quarreling and she gained her consciousness and finally left him. Now I had two choices. Break this marriage and leave her or marry her. I decided not to leave her and I agreed to go through with the marriage. And now we are happily married. That guy and his mother again tried to use black magic against us. But this time our bond was so tight it didn't affect us. After all this I changed a lot. I don't trust people anymore and always get ready to punch somebody in the face if anybody gives me problems. The same priest who told us what had happened before later said that this guy tried to send four ghosts my way just to break up my marriage and abort our kid. This time I had had enough and I used the same tactics that he had used against us and sent everything back to him. Last I heard, he was hospitalized. Moral of the story, please don't try using black magic for selfish purposes. It will come back to haunt you, and it can destroy lives. Taken at Walmart, submitted by Tana. This is hands down the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I had dropped my mom off at Walmart and was just going to sit in the car and wait for her. I'd watch YouTube and cruise my social media, anything to get out of going into that crap box. I mean, God, I hate Walmart. I picked a parking spot where I could see the front door, and my mom would text me when she was done at the checkout, and I'd just pull up and get her. So I was sitting there watching something on YouTube when I think I see something out of the corner of my eye. I turn my head, but there's nothing there. Just another car about three spaces over. This was around 11.30 at night, and there weren't that many people in the store. I go back to watching my video, and then I think I hear a noise coming from behind me. So again, I check my surroundings. There's nothing, and no one was out there. I saw a guy gathering up carts in the parking lot, and for some reason became fixated on him as he was doing his job. I was just staring at him, when I heard a loud tap on my window. I came out of my trance to turn my head and I saw a guy wearing a hoodie holding up a hammer at my window and before I could even let out a scream the passenger side door opened 
and some other guy with one of those skull face masks that covers the bottom of your face, he jumps into the car and points a knife at me. Hammer guy opens the back door, and I let it wail. I mean, I was freaking terrified and screaming my head off. The door slams shut, and knife guy is screaming at me to shut up and start driving. I'm so scared, I don't know what to do, but he screams at me again, and I start up the car, hit the gas, and then hit the brakes, knocking us back and forth. Hammer guy says to cut the bullshit and start driving, and I won't get hurt. I was terrified. I cannot tell you how scared I was. But I didn't want to drive, and they both started yelling, DRIVE! DRIVE! So I do it. I start to drive towards the entrance of Walmart, and Hammer Guy grabs my forehead from behind and says, NO, YOU BITCH, TO THE STREET! I turn and go to the entrance, and he yells, RIGHT! GO RIGHT! And this is going to lead us out of town. And all I was thinking was, I want my mom and dad, and I'm so scared they're going to kill me or rape me or both. My cell phone was in my lap, and it started ringing. It was my mom. Knife guy says not to answer it, and hammer guy tells him to grab my phone. He says no way. It's between her legs, and I'm not going to touch her or hurt her in any way. <laughs> yeah, what a nice guy, right? My cell rings again and again as I keep driving, and the only sound in the car is my crying and their heavy breathing and my ringtone, which at the time was Look What You Made Me Do by Taylor Swift, and I fucking hate that song now. So these two guys start talking to each other about what they need to do now, but they're not speaking in sentences I can understand. It was all like two or three word codes that only they got. Finally, after a few minutes of driving, we're coming to a BP station and Hammer Guy tells me to pull into the side and he gets out and runs inside. I turn to the knife guy and start begging with him to let me leave. He can take the car. Tears streaming down my face. He didn't say a word. He just stared at me through that skull mask thing, and it was making me cry even harder because he's not saying anything. Finally, Hammer Guy gets back in and says to keep going. I don't know what else I can do, so I go, and we drive for another 20 minutes, and we're almost to the town next over from mine. There's an empty bus stop on a corner, and Knife Guy says to pull over to the bus stop, so I do it, and he says to park and get out of the car. I do it, and they do too. They pull me over to the little bus stop shelter area that's got glass up to protect people from the rain, and there's a little space between the frames and the glass. Knife guy takes out some shoelaces and ties my wrist to the shelter pole and says to keep quiet for five minutes or they'll be back. Hammer guy ran back to the car screaming for the other guy to get in the car too, but the knife guy puts my iPhone in my hands and stares at me for what seemed like five minutes but was really probably only like five seconds. You remind me of my sister. Please don't ever sit in a car alone at night anywhere ever again. Then he turns, runs over to the car, jumps in, and they take off. I peed myself. But I was able to raise the phone up to my face and call my mom, but she was also on the phone with the police, so it took her a second to switch over to me. She was hysterical and asking so many questions about how I was and where I was, and I couldn't even answer her. Finally, I told her where I was, and someone else was with her on the phone, and it was the police, so she relayed that to them. There I was, standing under a streetlight for about ten minutes before I heard the sirens and saw about six cop cars come flying up the street. They came and untied me and put me in the car, and my mom came up a few minutes later. The rest of this is boring, but the end of the story is they never caught those guys. They found our car about 120 miles away where the cops think they stole another car. There was nothing wrong with our car, and it even had the keys in the glove compartment. I'm still in therapy and don't drive anywhere alone anymore, and I will never even consider sitting in the car for any reasons anymore. I leave for college next fall, and I'm hoping I can deal with my issues okay there. I'm dealing, but the thing that still sits with me to this day is the look on that guy's face and his eyes when he told me to never park alone in a car again. I mean, this is a guy who just carjacked a young girl, kidnapped me at knife and hammer point, and he's giving me big brother advice? Yeah, thanks man. You traumatized me for life, but you still seem to care. <sighs> Damn, dude. Hey gang, thanks for listening to Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. I hope you enjoyed this volume. If you have a true scary story, 
please send it to Uncle Josh, True Scary Stories at gmail.com. I read them all. Please also think about liking, sharing, and subscribing to this channel. If you do subscribe, please make sure to click on the little bell to make sure that you get notifications of all of my new uploads. Follow me on social media. All of my links are in the description below. And if you'd like to support this channel, consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page. There's a link for that in the description below as well. For as little as $1 a month, you can get access to content before it's available on YouTube, as well as other perks. And I'm still looking for your scary Halloween stories. Want to give you the best Halloween episode ever. Until next time, be excellent to each other. And remember, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door. <laughs>